Good morning. I hope you can hear me. My name is Ricky Burdett from the London School of Economics, and I'm delighted to chair this session with a mayor and a former deputy mayor, and therefore we're talking about cities. Um, I'm also keen to uh, underline the fact that this is an event organized obviously by the Forum, uh, but together with the, the Hellenic Observatory from uh, the London School of Economics, Kevin Featherstone, who's a specialist in things of this area, is here and was one of the key players in arranging it. This wonderful title, by the way, Thriving an, uh, Amid Turbulence, was not my title, but it's very good, because in a way it, it summarizes the problem of cities, which is, if you just think of what's been happening in the last years, just the last two years, cities have been on the front line of everything. They've been on the front line of the pandemic, they've been on the front line of uh, today of refugee status, and as people like Costas and uh, Jean-Louis, who've had to, in a way, deal with the situation immediately. I'm not saying that national government is not responsible or, 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 uh, or has to um, respond to these situations, but I think cities actually deal with this on the front line. We're going to have a 40-minute uh, session. I wanted to just start by setting the scene with a very few images and slides. Obviously, we're going to focus on the two cities represented here, but it's probably useful to represent the context. We're going to look at Athens, we're going to look at Paris, and the reason we're looking at Athens is because Costas and I and our respective teams have been working together now for two years on something called the Urban Age Task Force, which is really working city with university to try and improve services, understand how one can learn from other cities, and hence the dialogue, of course, with our colleague from Paris. These are two extraordinary cities, uh, one slightly older than the other, but both very interesting from one point of view, which is the shape of the city and the way it's managed. And I'm just going to touch upon that, and that will be the basis of the questions. But just the background, cities are not the same. Sometimes people talk about cities as if it's exactly the same thing. And this map just shows you how fast some cities around the world are growing, how many people are moving into each city every minute that I speak. So in places like Kinshasa, Lagos, there's one person basically moving in every minute. In other parts of the world, they're reducing, they're shrinking, as they say, and therefore the pressures uh, in terms of what actually happens in these cities is enormous. And here's where I want to just uh, set a very different context. In Athens, Costas knows this, in a period, which is a decade or so ago, actually, uh, Athens lost population. Paris has been growing steadily, a little bit more now, in fact, over the years. So, again, how do you deal with a city where maybe younger people are leaving and going to work elsewhere? And I think this is issues of growth and, and decline are absolutely central to this. Now, let's see whether we can go forward. Another aspect which is very important, as I said, is the shape of the city. We'll talk about that. Cities can be like Los Angeles, sprawling absolutely everywhere, or People are packed together, and Athens and Paris are very particular because they're actually very, very dense. And uh, we at the London School of Economics and the group that I run actually measure this thing called density, how many people live close together. And the diagram that you see, the red spike over there on the top, the taller that is, the denser it is. In other words, if we had five times as many people in this room, it would be denser. And if you, there were only two people in the room, it would be less dense. And actually, these two cities are very, very similar. Actually, the, they have a lot of people very close together, which causes situations of opportunity, but also situations of crisis. And the relation between density where people live and work and their transport infrastructure is fundamental. And I know that for Costas, this is a big issue that we'll talk about in a moment. I don't want to uh, be unkind to Athens, but the comparison between the sheer amount of public transport system there is in Athens compared to Paris, you know, there you can see the diagrams, right? The amount of red lines, the amount of public transport rail-based has actually uh, been there for probably more than 100 years in the case of Paris. So these are two very different cities with therefore different types of use of the city. And I think this becomes fundamental, but just look at these statistics. In Athens, I'm sure Costas will correct me, but it's something like only 14, only 14% of the population uses public transport to go to work. 
in Paris, it's something like 30% probably going up. And look at the number of people who use cars. And interestingly, uh, if you compare Paris and Athens in terms of the amount of green space we have per person, they're both actually quite low uh, compared to, say, London, which is four times as high. I'm setting this as a context as to why these two individuals are involved in actually setting different policies about how, the, how to change, how to improve the city. Jean-Louis, and I'll ask him to explain this a little bit more, and Anne Hidalgo, the mayor with whom he's worked um, in the last eight years, has been responsible for um, investing in the city's cycle infrastructure, 300 uh, million euros in the last years, and it's made a difference. And of course, Costas has started uh, in a pretty strong way in trying to uh, also uplift, shall we say, the quality of pedestrian and um, cycleways with the Great Walk in, in his city, in Athens. Uh, let me just end by talking and mentioning, I think, one other important point. Let's see whether this works. Is the one of inequality. All cities have people who are at the top at the, at the bottom. It's inevitable. Society is like that. But where they're located is different from every city. So the darker colors here in red show you where in Athens the most deprived people live. And as you know, those of you from Athens, those of us who are from outside need to study it, it's mainly the north and the west. And actually in the case of Paris, it's a different sort of physiognomy. In fact, the center is relatively well off. It's also the fringes of the city. So how do you deal with that will be one of the issues. And the final point I want to make is the issue of governance, which is, interestingly, both Athens and Paris, here we go, um, if you see the tiny little area with the red lines in the middle, that's what Costas is in charge of, right? So it's actually quite a small part of a much bigger context, which is the metropolitan area, of course, Attica, with its own sort of governance. So how do you deal with air quality? How do you deal with issues of that sort when you're sort of cutting across all the areas? And Paris, in a way, has got the same themes. So that's very much as a way of introduction and context. And let me start by asking uh, Jean-Louis. I don't want to talk too much about COVID, right? Because I th right, that's not the theme. But you've been in charge of your city for... Uh, well, one way or another, nearly 12 years, 12 years, right? Apart from COVID, what, have you, what has changed most dramatically in, in your city and what have you found in a way most difficult? Well, thank you for this presentation, which was very, very interesting. And <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, forum. Uh, first of all, I want to say that what changed dramatically in Paris, and I think in other regions, <coughs> is the use of public space. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the transformation of the use of public space, of course, the, the, the most spectacular is about <coughs> the share of cars and, and bikes and, and pedestrians uh, uh, in the public space. And of course, in Paris, uh, <coughs> for example, now we have some uh, congestion traffic of bikes. Uh, so it's so surprising because uh, we thought at the beginning that the bike lanes were uh, uh, wide enough to, to manage the traffic. But during the rush hours, we have some uh, problems of, uh, of congestion. And this changed fundamentally the, 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 the visage of the, of the city. But I think that we have to go a step further. It's not only a question of mobility. It's also a question of <coughs> living in the public space. I mean that people are more and more using uh, cafe terraces, parks, uh, uh, gardens uh, to eat, to have conversations, uh, and uh, of course demonstrations and uh, exhibitions and, uh, and performances. So it means that the public space is less and less a public space of mobility and a, and, 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 and a site where people are just moving, but it's also a place where people are living, staying, and uh, using it like as a uh, place of life. So I think it's the most spectacular 
change. And I was in Athens <coughs> uh, just before coming here, and uh, I, my, my vision of Athens is exactly the same. So people are in the streets, and they are living in the streets. I'm saying what, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, what I'm saying, obviously Costas knows that uh, in the case of Athens, there are a lot of people on the streets, but there are a lot of people in their cars, and we saw the, the statistics. Uh, and all I'm saying, Jean-Louis, is that the point you just made is not just a question of policy, that you, you write a policy and people start getting out of their cars and going into using bikes. It's a question of mindset. How do you change people? So what, you arrived day one, you did the great walk, and? Absolutely. It's much more, it has much more to do with the software uh, rather than the hardware. It has much more to do with actually what's in our heads. But um, this is a key challenge, I think, for cities around the world, including Athens, uh, in the years and in the decades to come. In the 20th century, we built cities around cars. In the 21st century, we have to build cities around ourselves. So practically, as you rightly said earlier, it has to do with a new understanding of public space as a public good. And it also has to do with sustainable mobility, which means that, of course, uh, drivers have rights, but so do passengers, uh, so do cyclists, so do pedestrians. In Athens, we uh, moved forward uh, during the pandemic I cannot pretend that it was easy, mm. but I think that the policy has been paying dividends and has been paying environmental dividends. Let me give you just one example. Uh, Panepistimiu, which is one of the main uh, boulevards uh, where we actually uh, tried to control and limit uh, traffic, saw a decline in CO2 emissions according to a study of our national university, that exceeds 25%. Yeah. Now, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, and this actually brings to fore the role of cities when it comes to the, cli to cli the climate crisis. Uh, it's easy for many of us to think that this is something rather distant that's going to be decided in Glasgow last year or in Washington or in Brussels, but in real life, uh, cities are responsible for 70% of CO2 emissions. So it's uh, an international problem, clearly, that uh, requires a local solution. I mean, it's interesting that the 70% of CO2 emissions comes from cities. Sounds terrible, but actually what it means is that if you implement changes that you did in Paris, you can actually have a massive impact on the planet by reducing the carbon footprint of, of cities, right? So actually it's not necessarily... It, that's why I'm saying cities are the front line. So what actually happened in Paris? Give, give, give some very concrete examples of changes you made. Well, the changes, the, the, the more visible changes were uh, with the uh, building of a, a, a city uh, a cycling friendly and, uh, and making uh, cycling in the city uh, uh, secure, uh, uh, safe. <clears throat> and when you, when you create uh, uh, bike lanes, you generate uh, bikers. And when you create uh, roads, you generate cars. So the, the, the mayors are, are a very strong responsibility because when there is a traffic jam, the first move is to say, well, I have to extend the lines. But if I do extend the lines, I create more traffic jam. <clears throat> and this is one of the key uh, a, a vision of the future of cities. And another thing which is very important about compact city like uh, Athens and Paris is that the key word, the key concept is mobility as a service. It's more efficient to have a system of mobility as a service than having a system of mobility as a tool owned by people, owning cars, owning bicycles. In Paris, for example, we have a system of uh, free-floating uh, electric bikes uh, uh, run by the city mm -hmm. and uh, 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 people are using it very frequently because it's uh, electric bike is maybe the best way when you are in, in shape, of course, the best way to, 
uh, uh, to uh, commute in a city. Do you use a bike? To go yes, to work? yes, I use a, an electric bike, not yeah. a bike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, because I'm living on Montmartre, you know, that's, so that's, yeah. I cannot do it without uh, electricity. Which raises <laughs> the, the issue of geography. Mm. I mean, Athens is steep. Yeah, like it Paris. Maybe, yeah, yeah. okay, the, yeah. that's, that's true, Athens, but do you, one Athens. has an impression of Paris being flatter than, than Athens, but not true, right? Oh, well, yeah, true. I mean, yeah. Athens um, yeah, does have hills. Uh, and those of us who know Athens very well are not surprised by that. And, of course, uh, Athens has 330 days of sunshine per year, so the temperatures are actually higher. Uh, having said that, however, we are actually right now in the process of preparing an open bid uh, to invite... Uh, Electron, electric uh, bicycles, uh, uh, electric bicycle platforms uh, to come to Athens. We have actually have a relatively positive experience with scooters, uh, and now that they're actually coming back to our lives after COVID, uh, we are reframing um, the regulatory context, uh, and we think that the electric bikes uh, can be rather, rather helpful. Um, having said that, of course, um, Athens has lost precious time, and there is no, I mean, many of us who are in this room know this very well, uh, there is no point um, in actually, you know, uh, trying to, to hide the obvious. Uh, we are, we have, it sure feels that, like, we have been at the center of a perfect storm for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we have this cost of living crisis, before that we, have the, we had COVID, we had the refugee crisis, we had the economic and financial crisis, there were times just a few years ago when Athens felt like the Weimar Republic. But even before that, uh, we had our own... Yeah, apologies. Uh, but even before that, we had our own urban crisis. As you said, we have actually lost mm. two out of five residents uh, since the turn of the millennium. So here is a challenge right now for us to reinvent our services on the one hand, and at the same time to reinvest on the necessary infrastructure, which may well have to do with something as small as a pocket park, which will not change the city, but will certainly change the neighborhood, or, uh, or a playground, or an open court, or it could be something as big as investing in our urban lungs. Uh, I think Oskibos, our National Garden, Likavitos Hill, Stephis Hill, or something even bigger, like uh, this uh, big program that we call Double Rejuvenation, the Plianaplasi in Greek, mm -hmm. which is probably the biggest urban uh, transformation uh, project that's actually uh, being implemented in what, Europe. What, what, as is, we speak. what does it do? What, what is the? Well, the idea is that there is this area in Athens which is actually very close to the heart of the city called Votanikos, which has been largely neglected uh, for many, many years. Uh, we are actually uh, creating, uh, we are building a new football stadium in this area, and at the same time, uh, we are uh, putting in place new infrastructure. So essentially, it's a new city. Mm -hmm. uh, the logic is that of defense, but of course, very different from the point of view that uh, green, for example, green areas uh, has been estimated to touch 50% of the total um, area. And on the other hand, at the center of the city, we are going to demolish an old stadium and create uh, a new uh, green area that's very, very important for Athenians to actually take their breaths. So, I mean, often when one has a discussion about cities and particularly the economy of cities, jobs, whether people come or people leave, right? I mean, mayors tend to say, we can't do anything about it, right? It's, it's got to do with the national economy, it's got to do with uh, uh, ge geo, uh, well, geopolitical issues, um, globalization, etc. You're arguing that actually if you improve the livability of the city, people will come back or want to stay, right? Two things. And uh, I, I want both of you to comment on I that. Mean, I'd like to say two things about that. I mean, clearly it's true uh, that, I mean, mayors do not run the world, right? I mean, national governments do. But there are things that we can do. So, for example, we were talking earlier about uh, the double rejuvenation project. We have estimated that this is going to bring 
uh, direct investments that exceed 450 million uh, euros just uh, in the first few months and no. first few years. Now that's me. That translates into many high-quality jobs. But there's, I think, also a larger point that us mayors should not underestimate. Mm. Um, I remember uh, back in September 2019, it sure feels like a, another lifetime, mm. uh, The Economist published um, an article about Greece. Uh, now, those of us who have been following The Economist know that it's not the most, uh, let's say, positive no. uh, medium when it comes to Greek affairs. But the article was, was glowing. Uh, it was wonderful. It was really optimistic, uh, you know, um, amongst many other things, uh, pointing to the uh, a, to the reform drive of the new government. But on top of the article, there was this picture of Athens. Right? And it wasn't the Acropolis. It wasn't the Kavitos. It showed um, a closed door full of graffiti, a dirty yeah. area, and uh, there was uh, someone sleeping. Uh, on the pavement. So the picture was actually telling any potential investor, Don't come stay back. away. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the challenge for us, to create an environment that is friendly, uh, that is positive, that is safe. And when we do that, we see that's work, that it works. Take Omonia Square. Yeah. In a moment, we'll come back to what are the things that stop you from doing that. Microphone. I think that uh, municipalities, mayors, can do things w with the question of uh, population. But you have to be careful. For example, in Paris, my, my, my vision was not of Paris intramuros, but of the greater Paris. Because when somebody is moving from, uh, from Paris center to uh, uh, the, the suburbs, it's not a problem. It's just a, a choice of life, you know. <clears throat> But, of course, if the, the metropolis is losing people, it's different. And my vision is very simple. You're, of course, quality of life is a, is a key factor uh, of people uh, uh, living in a city. But you need also uh, affordable housing. Uh, you need also to have a, a good vision of your uh, uh, specialty in, in, in the field of economics. Uh, when I was in charge of uh, economic development and uh, innovation, I was obsessed to make Paris uh, a, a, a city friendly to startups. And at that time, in, in, two, in 2008, we were very late. And now we are a leader uh, in the economy of knowledge, economy of innovation. And I think that it's also a key factor of people living in the city. So, so you have to see all the dimensions of the so, question of livability of a city. So what, what did you do, literally, to be friendly to startups? I put one billion euros uh, on the what? table. <laughs> and and, and uh, we have created incubators, accelerators. We negotiate with uh, universities and research departments to have incubators inside the universities. And we try to make a, 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 a good relationship between big companies and startups, uh, uh, and we negotiate with the government in order to to have this strategy at the level of the uh, of the city. So it's 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 a question, and we did that during ten years. So if you want to make this kind of policy, you need time. Did, did you want to come? A billion yeah. euros is nice to have. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure our minister responsible. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure Mr. Skilakaikis, our minister uh, responsible, would be very happy to share this money with the city of Athens. But okay. um, I think there is uh, an important point here that you make, um, that what we see right now is rising inequalities. Yeah. And we experience the effects of these inequalities, especially on urban centers. Um, the, and Athens is um, an example of this. Uh, we cannot underestimate these. On the contrary, uh, we have to implement policies that help with social cohesion and bring people together. Uh, we do this as we speak in the city of Athens, having, amongst other things, uh, we in, 
during the pandemic, we drawn our solidarity net. But we are fully aware of the fact that we still have a long way to go. I mean, one of the issues there with both of you is what powers does a mayor actually have? And it's interesting, if I think of Athens, I think of Paris, and I think of London, um, I'm not the mayor, but the mayor has some powers that you do and, and others that, interestingly, the mayor of London has total control over transport, total control for, for the wider region and five billion um, pounds, euros a year budget. That's a very, very significant, but doesn't have control over education, for example. Right? And I think you have control over some things, but not others, which raises an issue of governance, which I, I showed those maps of where the jurisdiction, where the powers of these two gentlemen are. And in relation to the whole area, it's actually quite limited, right? The, you were referring to that. What are the greatest barriers for you in Athens in relation to Attica, but also national government plays a big part in what happens to your city, right, in, in terms of investment, and then same point for Paris, because I know that Paris is thinking of creating effectively a larger forum for the Ile de Paris, which is the 11 million region as opposed to the 2 million city of which you've been the deputy mayor, but go on. Well, um, we're actually rather fortunate uh, because we have an excellent cooperation both with the region and with the national government. Um, having said that, this is not actually a reflection of institutional arrangements. Mm, yeah. It's actually a reflection of political dynamics, which raises a broader issue. Can you just clarify to everyone here? Is this, this is not always the case, because it depends. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, sure. yeah. uh, which raises a broader issue. Mm. Uh, the fact that, uh, on the one hand, unfortunately, uh, local government in Greece um, is still uh, treated by the Greek political system like the uh, like a, a minor. Uh, I think we have exactly the same problem in Paris. You know, that makes me I think better. I think it's a, it's the same problem all over the world. It is. Uh, most mayors I speak to uh, in Europe um, agree on this. But um, I think there's a very strong case to be made for decentralization, for transparency, uh, and for actually strengthening uh, the one democratic institution that's actually closest to the citizen. I mean, we, we have left behind the time of um, hierarchies, and we're now living a time of networks. It's a completely new mentality and a completely new outlook. Um, on the other hand, uh, in Athens and in Greece, uh, we suffer from uh, coordination failures. So fa take, for example, the question of mobility. Uh, if one poses a simple question, who is responsible about traffic in Athens? Who do we blame? Who do it's always the mayor. The mayor is always uh, <laughs> to blame for everything. But uh, I mean, legally, who do we blame? Do, who do we call? There isn't one phone number. There isn't one address. There isn't one name. There are more than seven different agencies that fail to coordinate or even communicate. And as a result, uh, the let's say, institutional jungle is mirrored in a jungle in the streets. So what can you do about it? So uh, the good news is that my understanding is that uh, the government and the minister responsible, Kostas Karamalis, is moving forward right now. And he's going to bring a new legislation uh -huh. creating one agency, one single agency, that will be responsible both for uh, designing policies of mobility but also for implementing uh, mobility policies in Athens and in Attica. Well, <clears throat> uh, I should have said exactly the same things. You know, you, 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 when, when a Parisian asks, tell me the, the, the subway is dirty, my, my first answer is, it's not our responsibility. <laughs> it's, look, look at the president of the, of the region, Ile-de-France. 
uh, and, and, and generally the, 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 the Parisian answer, it's not my problem. You have to make it clean. And I know you as a mayor. Uh, uh, I don't know the president of the, of the region. So this is it, you know, this is it. The mayor is the first contact with uh, all the, the, the citizenry in, uh, in, in a city. And <clears throat> of course, we have to keep in mind that Metropolisation, metropolises, is a great urban phenomenon of the 21st century. But it's a very recent phenomenon. And this is why we don't have uh, uh, governing bodies uh, adapted to uh, the phenomenon of metropolis. And uh, uh, the problem in Paris is that you have the region, 12 million people, you have said it, and we have the city, two million people, but the dense part of the uh, uh, région parisienne, what we call région parisienne, it's 10 million people in a very small area. You, we have seen it in your, in your uh, presentation. And this part of the city has the same problems, but they don't have a body to govern it. Yeah. So this is the problem of the 21st century. We have to transform our institutions, our local institutions, and it's very difficult because people are fighting together and people are upset one with another, yeah. and, uh, and, and there is no vision, no global vision of the governance I mean, of, of the metropolis. Of course, this raises an issue of power and who's in charge, right? But interesting, I mean, I, I, I guess those of us who live and work in London have to be relatively optimistic about this because um, you all know that London has a mayor, but I don't know how many of you know that that's only been the case for 22 years. So we invented the institution of a directly elected mayor in the year 2000. It was part of the Tony Blair Labour government manifesto to do that. And there was a fear, always a fear, that the mayor of London would become slightly more powerful than the prime minister. So Boris Johnson has solved the problem. <laughs> He was mayor and a very, a very, a very, a very famous mayor of London told me that uh, a local institution in Great Britain is North Korea with elections. It is what is North Korea with elections. Yes, no, <laughs> that, 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 very clear. But the, the, this, in terms of institutional change, cost us. What would you want to see? I mean, you've always talked about in the answers up until now that. You're happy that central government is making changes, but what would you like well, to see change in um, terms of you know you or the future mayors? Well, I palace? would say that if we want to um, if we want to be serious about Greek local government gaining its independence, you know, growing up, adulthood, there is a rite of passage mm. uh, that could be described. In, you know, in the phrase, uh, show me the money. Right now, uh, Greek local government is dependent on the Greek national uh, government. So whenever we want uh, to secure funds, uh, we have to, to, in some way or form, uh, come and cooperate with the central government even if we design our own monetary tools, financial tools, which we do. However, there's a property tax, right? It's called Enfia uh, in Greece. This property tax can be transferred to local government. Right. And that would mean that we, we, that would actually mean that we would be able to, uh, to secure, on the one hand, liberate ourselves from the constraints of the political system. But on the other hand, it would also mean that the mayors and the city councils would be directly accountable to the citizens about what they do with their money. No. No. Is that the feeling in Paris? That people well, my, my feeling is that <coughs> we, we, we should encourage the dynamics of uh, metropolises. Uh, and, uh, so the, the, the good solution is forget about uh, organization uh, model and uh, look at the project. For example, when we launch the uh, Grand Paris Express project, a 30 billion euros project of a new railway system in, in, in the greater the city, Paris, yeah, yeah. in the greater Paris, 200 uh, uh, railway stations, 
<coughs> so uh, the, the, the state, the region, the city put money on the table. And we have created a dedicated body to, uh, uh, to govern, to pilot, to pilot this, uh, uh, this project. And when, when you have uh, <coughs> a, a big project like that, all the energies are converging. And I am very in favor to have this vision of organizing project by project, big project by big project, the system in order to have a new vision. And of course, the question of a metropolis is <clears throat> of, a, of a global city is a question of networking. Networking of uh, fiber optic, networking of 5G. Uh, net you, you understand what I mean? Yeah. The, 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 the metropolis is a platform and a network. So you have to, to have this vision of the, of the system as a platform and a network and to organize the cooperation and to create, maybe what, we, what you, you can do by law is to create a duty to cooperate right. between all the partners. So we have only a few minutes left and you use the word four or five times now, vision, right? And what I'd like to conclude with uh, here is what has been the driving vision in the case of Paris and then I'm going to come to you Assuming that you might run for re-election, possibly, right? That might happen. When is that? In two years. But 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 um, Jean-Li, one of the key f slogans you and Anne Hidalgo used was the concept of urban commons, right? This is a very, for me, very powerful notion. Can you, in one minute, explain it? Yeah. Well, the, 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 you, you use this concept at the beginning, uh, saying it's a, it's a, a, a public space is a, a, a common good. And uh, this concept of urban common is that saying that public space, it's not a public-owned or private-owned territory. It's a common good. And the, the, the air we breathe, the, the drinking water we drink, uh, uh, the, the, the quality of the, of the commerce of a city, all of these things, all, the, all of these things, and of course, social housing, all of these things are uh, common goods and uh, 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 urban commons. And governing urban commons uh, in the 21st century is a very specific task because you have all the stakeholders, public, private, associative, citizens, who have to be around the table and to have a shared governance. So it's very difficult because all our laws are designed to make a separation between public and private and to make the public uh, uh, people in charge of something and the private people in yeah, charge of other things. So the question is sharing the governance. Right, and you know, the, the, this slogan, which has a strong concept behind it, did win the election. I mean, that was, the, that was Paris en commun. No? Yeah. Was the, Paris en commun was the, was the name of the, of the, uh, of the association campaign. and the campaign we have made in uh, 2020. So what's going to be your slogan? Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, slogan aside, yeah. um, it, think about Athens in 2030. What's going to be the one key performan performance index? What's the one key KPI? It's going to be weather we have been able to increase our population. Right. Whether people, especially young people, mm -hmm. have come back to Athens. So this has to do mm -hmm. with the quality of life from the, more, from the moment you wake up in the morning till the moment you go to bed. It has to do, for example, with the fact that for the first time in our history, we now have a public option of pre-K, uh, kindergarten. It has to do with the fact that we are actually rebuilding uh, dozens of playgrounds. It has to do with the fact that we're actually heavily, heavily investing in our schools, uh, in our buildings, in our school buildings. Uh, it has to do with, uh, with sports, with uh, sm smaller and bigger courts. It has to do with our sidewalks. It has to do with all these small things that usually are not part of a grand vision, which, however, when they sum up, they become something very, very big. So when we, our daily when, life. when we come here in 2030, at the Delphi Forum, and I showed the slide of in, that I showed in red that uh, Athens had decreased population by 16 percent. 
when you will have been mayor at that point for eight, nine years, that means if it if will the, say I, what number? We'll say if 2%. our population has decreased, right. then clearly I have failed, right. whether I won the election or not. Okay. Well, we now have a reason to know how we measure success in the case of the mayors of these two cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.